Good morning and welcome to our Bible class. We're in a study entitled, Until I Return, What Jesus Wants Every Believer to Know. Lessons from John chapters 14 through 16. We're using a book by Jeff Walling for a majority of our material. I tell the story of a lady who was driving down a narrow country lane when she nearly went into a ditch when a car came around the sharp turn ahead of her on the wrong side of the road. When she yelled, watch where you're going, as she passed by his window, the offending driver said, pig. Well, the stunned woman shot back and said, you're the pig. And she was just fuming with anger until she spun around the curve ahead and nearly crashed into a huge pig who was wallowing in the mud hole right there in the center of the road. And the point is simple. Some warnings are only, only understood too late. Other warnings simply are not believed. Maybe it's because we've heard these words of caution all of our lives. I mean, how many times have we said or heard the following statements? You play with that BB gun and you keep running with those scissors and you're going to, if you drive that way all the time, I tell you, you are sure to, or how about this one? If you sit too close to the TV set, fill in the blank, right? But Jesus offers some words of caution that are just a little bit different than that. Jesus knew what was coming, and he knew what his followers needed to know. And that was, guys, I need you to stay close to me. My son learned this lesson as a young child. When he was about four or five years old, we took him to a preschool in Op, Alabama. And every Thursday, the tradition was is that I would pick him up and take him to the local pizza hut for the pizza buffet. Give me some pasta and breadsticks. Well, I remember on one occasion handing him a plate and he started to work his way down the buffet line until I guess he forgot where he was and he latched onto the leg of another man. And he looked up and he thought, you're not my daddy. And immediately he was terrified thinking that maybe I had left him. I said, hey, Clint, buddy, I'm over here. Needless to say, he was pretty relieved that daddy was still in the Pizza Hut place. Well, you know, Jesus always has our best interest at heart, and it's imperative that we learn to stay close to him. But you know, we're often like children who quickly run away from their parents. And when that happens, when we, when we finally find them, we have two reactions sometimes. We, we want to kiss them and we want to kick them at the same time. We tell them, you've got to hold on to my hand and they, in all innocence, ask us, but why? How do you explain to a child that their life is in danger? That they're not big enough, they're not smart enough to handle this world on their own? It's quite frustrating. Well, Jesus had told his disciples that he was leaving. He told them that the Holy Spirit would guide them, that he would lead them into all truth. But as he looks around the table on this night, it's pretty apparent that his apostles, his disciples, don't get it. And so Jesus has these words to say in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit. Show yourselves to be my disciples. You notice a word that he repeats over and over again. It's the word remain, or if you're looking at another version, it says abide. Specifically, it's to say, remain in me. Don't let go of my hand. You know, if some of us were honest, we're kind of like stubborn children. 
You know, we just want to say to God, I don't want to hold on to your hand anymore. We're tired of doing it. We, we think that somehow we are self-sufficient. We think that we're spiritually mature, that we can do anything. And, and so we defiantly wander off to explore these new and exciting places. And, and we go where we shouldn't go and we do what we shouldn't do. And, and then we try to fix the situation ourselves and we only make matters worse. And then we think, you know, if only I had just held on to the hand of the Lord, I wouldn't be in such a mess. Well, what are some lessons we can see from this text that will help us today to stay close to Jesus? Well, number one, Jesus says, remain in me because I am the true vine. And this is interesting because the, the story of Israel's relationship with God has more ups and downs than a yo-yo. I mean, it's one minute we love you, God, and we'll worship you alone, and the next minute they're dancing around golden calves. You remember in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 6, it says they sat down to eat and drink, and then they got up to indulge in pagan revelry. But this is interesting, because you know the context of this. They had just crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. They had seen the destruction of their Egyptian enemies. They were eating manna and quail that God was providing. They were even drinking water that came out of a rock. But for some reason, that just wasn't enough for them to remain faithful to God. He said their relationship to God was to be based on a covenant characterized by faithfulness. Yet as we study history of Israel, we know later on the prophet Hosea actually described Israel in his day as an adulterous woman. And Hosea's picture is quite tragic. He, he married an unfaithful woman who ran around and basically sold herself to other men like a prostitute. And even after Hosea's wife had prostituted herself even into slavery, Hosea went down to the slave market and bought her back. And Hosea's actions were an illustration about the way that God redeems us each day. But just like Hosea's footloose spouse, you know, we can be redeemed at evening prayer and then we're out sinning again the next morning. Well, what would prompt such unfaithfulness? Why, what, would, what would cause a Christian to kind of slip out the back door of a church and step into a world of sin? What leads a Christian to let go of the hand of Christ and, and maybe to even raise his hand in abuse against his wife or his children? Now, the words of Christ are clear. He says, I am the, notice, the true vine. There it is. You see, we are enamored, I think, sometimes with, with imitations, the fake vines, the, the false vines out there of money and power, pleasure and fame. Just take your pick, right? Be your own boss, have it your way, call the shots. But these false vines, no matter how sweet and how filling they may be today, they are destined to dry up and to blow away. And that's why we must stay connected and grafted on to the true vine, because it's the true vine, Jesus who will carry us through the toughest storms and the most difficult times. But secondly, Jesus says, remain in me because you cannot bear fruit alone. One of the most vivid illustrations that Jesus gives in the text is the role that his father, the gardener, plays. Again, let's notice some verses here from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 2 and verses 4 through 6. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He says, next, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches 
are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, we know that this pruning process is necessary for a tree to produce fruits. And it's not that you just go and just lop off branches indiscriminately, but you look for the barren branches and you remove those barren branches because they might inhibit or harm the rest of the plant or the tree. Well, here's the deal. We should want to be pruned or disciplined by God. Uh, trials don't come into our lives for no apparent reason. It, it's God's way of making sure that our hearts and our lives don't become worthless or useless branches. A trial such like COVID-19, it's often an attention getter. It's one from God, or, or maybe we could just describe it as a wake up call. But the greater fear is we don't want to become a dead branch. Why is that the case? Well, in Matthew chapter 13, verses 40 and 41, here's what Jesus has to say. He says, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will, notice this, will weed out of his kingdom, notice his kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Jesus makes it quite clear that the gardener will will tolerate no barren branches. They're going to be cut off and burned. And, and that's why it's important for us to stay connected to the vine, Jesus, because without him, we can't possibly bear fruit. Again, this is a hard lesson for us to learn. As we said earlier, it's a hard lesson, particularly for children. You know, some children are just notorious for breaking things. They wonder, you know, how hard do I have to pull this toy's head before it will come off? And then they're often successful in pulling that head off of that toy. And you find out about it later when you get up in the middle of the night and you walk to the bathroom and you step on that toy. <laughs> well, while toys can be reassembled and put back together, it's not that way with a branch. Once a branch is severed, it cannot bear fruit ever Again, it, it may even remain green and look healthy for some time, but eventually it will wither and die. And Jesus says, once it withers and dies, the gardener takes that fruitless branch and throws it into the fire to be burned. And so we don't want to be burned with fire. Rather, we want to bear fruit, and that's why we have to stay connected. I came across a, a great story from a preacher who was giving a lesson. I wish I knew his name, but he, he said, imagine a, a college age man as he sits next to his special lady on a pew at church. I mean, he's so enamored with her that he just takes his hand and he kind of rakes his hand through her lovely locks of hair. And then the hair may actually, you know, fall on his shoulder and he thinks, oh, this is so cool. We're, we're so connected. And, and the girl, she may even twirl or maybe even shake her hair as only you can do in a shampoo commercial. Right? It's such a beautiful moment. And you think, probably, well, Ross, who are you to talk about hair, right? Okay. But, but hair is beautiful. You, you don't mind touching it. You, you like connecting with it. But the moment that the hair is disconnected, <laughs> it's just gross and disgusting and disgusting you wouldn't touch that with your foot let alone your hand i mean how many times have you gotten your food and said there's a hair in my food you don't leave it there because it's disgusting it's been disconnected from where it was supposed to be you see once something is disconnected it loses its beauty and its appeal you see if we aren't connected to jesus we are guaranteed no fruit. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine. You're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you can bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Even if I had a branch right now in front of me and, and I held it up and I said, okay, let's all work really hard together. Uh, see if, we, if this branch can bear fruit. And now we could probably tape an apple or an orange or something to it. But, but that branch, 
it's got no chance. We can moan, we can groan, but the branch is not going to bear fruit because it's been cut off from its source. And so let's reiterate again what Jesus says. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. I mean, take a look at our society. We believe there's no problem we can't solve. There's no challenge that we can't meet. But consider our track record. Social injustice, well, we'll, we'll pass civil rights laws, but the problems are still there today. Drug problems among our youth, well, we'll just open up more private schools or, or we'll build bigger juvenile correction facilities. How about unrest across the globe? How about a pandemic? Well, we'll just send in the troops and we'll, we'll fire missiles. And, and we think at some point, you know, we're going to find a cure to this disease that's ravaged so many of our lives. And as we look, we, know, we notice that, that mankind hasn't been able to fix anything. One look around the globe should tell us that Jesus was right. Without the Lord's divine wisdom and merciful grace, we are lost and fruitless. Like branches that have been snapped off the vine, we cannot bear lasting fruit no matter how hard we try. But if we remain in Christ, we can bear fruit and not just a little fruit. And that's our third point, that Jesus says, remain in me, because if you do, I will make you fruitful. Again, let's keep looking at our text again. He says this, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. I wondered this morning, as we think about this, that how many of us used to believe that being a do-gooder was the supreme goal of the Christian life? I mean, each day we woke up and we set out basically with the Boy Scout philosophy to be helpful, to be kind, and to be courteous. But maybe we found this routine a little difficult to maintain. Our efforts were often viewed as weakness. We were taken advantage of by others. Our kindness was abused. Our, our helpfulness was overused. And to make matters worse, we were often underappreciated. And sometimes if my good deeds went unnoticed, I was quick to point them out in hopes that somebody else might give me proper recognition. And so the question becomes, how do we break ourselves from this cycle of works-based futility? Because it's an easy trap for us to fall into. Well, it happens with the change of focus. When we focus on the wrong thing, we will be unfruitful. And so instead of dwelling on the good deeds that we need to do, we begin to focus on the good Lord that we have the privilege of following. And when we focus on remaining in him, on knowing and trusting his word, our doing good becomes more natural and less awkward. And what this does is this takes the pressure off of us and it places the focus where it ought to be. You see, without Jesus, I am an absolute do-nothing. Trying to bear fruit on my own, it's like trying to turn on a light that's not plugged in. You ever tried to do that before? And so what we try to do is we try to replace the bulb, and if the light still doesn't work, we might wiggle, uh, wiggle the switch or, or fiddle with the socket. But sooner or later, you have to check the plug. If it isn't plugged in, no replacement bulb, no, only a, a strong connection will fix the problem in that situation. And so it is with Christ. Without Christ, we lack the power to produce the light that the world needs. Without Christ, we are simply lightless lamps. We're lumps of saltless salt and we're fruitless branches. But with him, I will be fruitful. I will be effective. And he promises that. The, the key 
is to remain in him, to stay close to him so we never, ever lose that connection. And if, if we ever experience what we might call a power drain in our lives, we need to check our connection to the vine. If life feels barren and difficult, reaffirm your reattachment or your attachment rather to the source. Again, Jesus said, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You see, when our branches are heavy with good fruit, we can remember who brought it all to pass. It was Christ. It was God. God gave the increase. God allowed it to grow. And so when we give God the glory and remain in the love and the guidance of his son, Jesus Christ, we're promised effective prayers, fruitful branches, and lives that can be filled with joy. All of that for not letting go of his hand. I love a story that Jeff gives uh, in the book. He shares a story that we can all relate to. He remembers when he was about five years old, his father taking him to a huge store. And like any boy that age, there was a toy that caught his eye. And he let go of his father's hand for just a minute and he slipped over to examine this especially cool looking truck. Well, he hadn't been there a minute when he turned around to show it to his dad, but his dad was gone, nowhere to be seen. Jeff began to panic. This is the moment he had worried about. His dad had seen his opportunity and had seized it. He had ditched his son. Well, Jeff did the only thing he knew to do. He started yelling his dad's name, Daddy! And about 50 men whose first names were Daddy peeked around the end of the aisle, but none of them were Jeff's dad. Well, his panic began to increase. He thought, you know, what do they do with the leftover kids at Kmart? Do they sell them the next day as a blue light special? <laughs> well, Jeff tried one more time, louder. He said, Daddy! And Jeff recognized this balding head as he peered around the end of an aisle and he ran to it as fast as he could. And his dad picked him up in his arms and held him tightly. Daddy, he cried, don't you ever leave me like that. And Jeff said, his dad smiled and said, how about we make a deal, son? You don't leave me, I won't leave you. Jeff said, deal accepted. Stay close to Christ, don't let go of his hand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we come before you today thanking you for all the wonderful blessings you give to us. And yet, Lord, we know that we live in very difficult and trying times. And Lord, in the midst of these challenging days that we live, Lord, we want to hold on to you. We don't want to let go of your hand. We, we want to be like the, the branch that is connected tightly to the vine. Father, we know that you will not let go of us, but Lord, we know that we can let go of you. And so, Father, help us. If we've gotten off the pathway, if we've turned away from you, help us to turn back to you today. And Father, again, to know if we'll just stay close to you, if we'll stay by your side, you'll lead us, you'll guide us, you'll help us, you'll give us the hope, the courage, and the strength that we need. Father, bless those who are sick, those who are hurting, those who are struggling. Father, thank you for the family of God, the church. We pray your blessings upon each and every member of this body. Lord, we love you and thank you for loving us. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna thank you for being with me this week. I invite you to join me again next week as we continue our study for the book, for the book of John, chapters 14 through 16. May God bless you.